at six o'clock. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. All right. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today for HMSC's Virtual Science on Tap. Um, I hope you are someplace comfortable with some good food and drinks since this is a virtual. Hopefully someday soon we'll be able to be back um, face to face, but we'll go with what we've got for now. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffitt and I'm the Research Program Manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center located in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for tonight's talk. One and just to let you know that this is a webinar format. So your mics, cameras, and screen shares are disabled. We do hope that you put any questions you might have for us into the chat, and we'll work through those at the end of tonight's presentation. If you have a clarifying question, you might put that in there, and if we need to, we'll get to it, but most likely we'll work through those questions at the end. Also wanted to make sure everybody was aware that we are recording this event, um, so feel free to share it um, or watch it again if you wanted to pick up something new. It'll be in our past seminar page in a few days, and I just put that link into our chat. A couple of quick announcements before we get started. Our next Science on Tap will be January 19th where Sylvia Yamada from the Department of Integrative Biology at Oregon State University will be talking about the European green crabs and if they're here to stay. So I'm hoping that you'll join us for that one. Um, and if you want any information about our upcoming events, you can go to HMSC's homepage, scroll to the bottom, and there's a calendar of events there that will have all the links so that you can get into those uh, virtual events. But why we're all here tonight, um, we're very excited to have Dr. Selena Hapel here to talk to us about her work with sea turtles. But first, just a little baby bit of background about her. Um, Dr. Hapel is a professor and the head of the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Sciences at Oregon State University. She has her bachelor's degree from the University of Washington, her master's from North Carolina State University, and her PhD from Duke. Dr. Hapel has been studying the population dynamics of sea turtles for 30 years. She has co-written uh, recovery plans and conservation strategies that evaluate uh, conservation strategy evaluations <laughs> for five different species. And she's currently working with researchers in South Florida faced with difficult choices to save the nesting populations. We're so excited to have Dr. Hapel here tonight to talk to us about her work. So Selena, the floor is yours, take it away. Thanks so much, Cinnamon, and it is great to be here. Um, I'm assuming we uh, have good audio and everything's going along. You can see my slides okay. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And yes, I have worked on many of the sea turtle species uh, around the world. We have in the United States, uh, we have uh, six of the seven worldwide species, and four of those can occur off the Oregon coast. Now, only one of them actually belongs on the Oregon coast, which is the leatherback turtle. Leatherbacks are adapted to cold water conditions, and so we actually can see them feeding on jellyfish off of our coast here occasionally. Um, but the, we do see other species here, including uh, green turtles, loggerheads, and olive ridley. Least. And those are animals that have been caught in warm water uh, currents and transported into our area accidentally, basically, because it really is too cold for them up here. And often when we find them on the beach, they're still alive, but they're sort of in a catatonic state. And uh, it takes quite a bit to revive them. And sometimes we're successful with that. There have been some that have been revived at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. Um, and when we're not successful with that, then of course we do everything we can to, to get as much information from the dead animal as we can and, and often uh, would have those at the uh, Hatfield Marine Science Center um, for uh, the dissection that the public can join us in. So um, yeah, sea turtles are iconic. People love them. Uh, I certainly do. And I've been working on them for a long time. Here's a good question for you all. Okay, so we're going to have a few questions and polls and things along uh, this year, uh, this talk tonight. Um, are sea turtles going extinct? So think about that. And this is not a poll. This is just something to think about right now. We'll do a poll later. Okay, so are sea turtles going extinct? And the answer is nope. <laughs> No species of sea turtle is in imminent danger of extinction. And by imminent, I mean in the next 20 to 30 years. 
sea turtle status worldwide, uh, the species are not going extinct, but there are populations that are in trouble. Many populations, including those with not large nesting sites, though, are recovering. And most species have been downlisted by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Some populations have not recovered or even continue to decline. And climate change is already having some impacts and could be a real problem for sea turtles in the next few decades. So just like polar bears, which are not in imminent danger of extinction, we know that there are climate change related changes in habitat and food availability and so on that are going to be problems problematic for sea turtles in the future. And just to give you some examples here, uh, loggerheads in Florida, uh, this is a species that I've worked with a fair bit. You see that um, over time, they've kind of gone up and back down and back up again. Uh, we have these occasional high nesting years. And, um, but look at the numbers here. We're talking 40,000, 50,000, even as high as 65,000 nests in Florida in one year. Um, and so that's, a lot of sea turtles, millions of hatchlings uh, released and out into the ocean. And so loggerhead turtles and other sea turtles in the U.S. are really in pretty good shape overall. Um, and the reason for that is uh, many fold. It is an amazing um, success story, actually. And we have some situations where, like at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center, the records of turtle, numbers of turtles nesting has actually uh, been broken in the last few years. So uh, we've really done a good job. It's, it's a success story. We've done a good job of protecting turtles and their habitats. And this is really because of international cooperation, conservation efforts, and education. So whether it's working with uh, the, the folks in Palau and other uh, Pacific nations on their uh, nesting green turtles or getting fishermen to release turtles off their boats in Uruguay or teaching kids about sea turtles in Kenya, uh, we can, we have done a lot of good work for sea turtles uh, by working together across international boundaries and sharing scientific information. In the United States, one of the big uh, uh, success stories for turtles is the turtle excluder device. So 30 to 40,000 turtles per year were killed annually in shrimp trawls in the US in the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, the development of these devices, which occurred through Sea Grant and working through um, the fishermen themselves helped design these as well as uh, a lot of good science to determine what worked and what didn't work. We now have these devices in the nets that uh, allow shrimp to continue to be caught because they go through these bars, uh, but the turtles or other large animals can get out. And that turtle excluder device has been shown to be very effective and has contributed to population recovery. But sea turtles still face a lot of threats, including capture in fishing, uh, fishing gear and capture uh, an entanglement in fishing gear. They are also harvested in some parts of the world, uh, legally and Ill illegally. Uh, these are hawksbill turtles on a, on a vessel uh, in the South Pacific. And then now we have the climate change issues that are really coming to a forefront. Um, because what we're finding is that sea level rise and rising temperatures are having a real impact on their nesting beaches. Now, um, another thing that, of course, many of you are probably thinking of, well, what about plastics? Well, plastics are uh, an issue for sea turtles. Um, and the uh, plastic bags do look like jellyfish, which is one of the primary prey items for many sea turtles. Um, and they just tend to grab and bite anything that floats around anyway, especially the juveniles. Um, and the problem, I'll just give you a little sea turtle anatomy uh, tidbit here, is that inside the throat of a sea turtle are downward pointing projections that prevent the things that they swallow from coming back up. So if you think about it, if you're out there slurping up jellyfish all day, 
you it's a good thing to have stuff in your throat to make sure that those jellyfish don't accidentally pop back out. Well, but what that means is that sea turtles can't throw up. So if they eat something that they're not supposed to, they really can't get it out except by going all the way through. Um, and so plastics uh, can be very problematic for individual animals. All right, so cinnamon, we're now gonna open our first poll. And the question that I'm asking is what are the largest threats to sea turtles in the United States now? So can you open that? That is All open. Right. Great, so everyone who's on Zoom, most folks who are on Zoom can now choose, you can, uh, I'd like you to choose up to three, not more than three, okay? So pick three things on this list that you think are major threats to sea turtles today. Okay, the numbers are coming in. Uh, everything's shifting around, giving everybody a chance to catch up here. The major threats to sea turtles in the United States now. Okay, I'm gonna give you about 10 more seconds here. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So here's, can everybody see those? Can we see those? Hopefully you can see those. All right, <laughs> great. So um, really interesting uh, the, how, how they, the, the results kind of spread out there. Um, there are, uh, it's quite a spread actually. Um, so not too many people thought that getting hit by boats or plastic straws are a big deal for sea turtles. And um, you're right about that. Uh, certainly those things, um, the boat hitting does happen. The sea turtles and the straws business and the whole big shebang about don't use plastic straws. Not using plastic straws is a good thing, but because it kills sea turtles is not really a good um, uh, reason not to use plastic straws. <laughs> um, there was in fact a sea turtle that got a straw stuck up its nose and that was a video that went viral and there was a, a, a big deal about it, but um, really plastic straws um, in and of themselves are not um, terribly problematic for sea turtles uh, compared to some of these other things. But one of the things that you'll notice here, and, and unfortunately I'm not gonna tell you the answer here because just like all scientists love to say, it depends. And the reason why it depends is it depends on the scale that you're looking at. Are you looking at, so I asked, what are the largest threats to sea turtles? But I didn't say sea turtle populations or individual sea turtles, right? And some of these threats are really a big deal for individual sea turtles but not necessarily a big deal for a whole population of sea turtles because it only affects a few individuals. Whereas other threats have the potential at least to impact whole populations. And my work is really focused at the population level and extinction risk for populations and species. And so some of the things that really are heart-wrenching for us um, that affect individuals aren't necessarily the things that folks like me pay as much attention to. So um, the, the fishing nets and, and, uh, and beach development, uh, these are things that can affect enough individuals to actually have an impact at the pool population level. Whereas plastic bags, uh, to some extent, um, plastic straws, getting hit by boats and so on, are more likely to have negative impacts on specific individual animals. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing that and move on here. So, sorry, went the wrong way. So the impacts to individuals can be heart-wrenching but often do not have detectable effects on populations. So here's an example of this poor little sea turtle comes out of its nest and uh, walks right into a plastic cup. 
Um, here's a sea turtle that got hit by a boat and you can see the prop scars here and how they had to, they brought it into the sea turtle hospital and glued it back together. Um, surprisingly, a lot of sea turtles survive uh, if we can find them soon enough and actually glue them back together uh, when they suffer injuries like this. But these kinds of impacts uh, are relatively small scale and don't necessarily affect whole populations. So if we think about what can make sea turtle populations go extinct in the 21st century, Overexploitation is still potential. Um, there is direct harvest, not in the US because it's illegal in the US, but um, certainly in other parts of the world. Um, but more importantly is that indirect harvest, that's the accidental catch or bycatch in fisheries. So uh, a lot of people fish for things that sea turtles like to eat themselves or that occur in sea turtle habitats, and sea turtles accidentally get caught in their gear, uh, on their hooks or on their in their nets. And so there's a lot of efforts worldwide to find ways to reduce that bycatch. But the big ones that we're going to talk about today are habitat loss and degradation due to climate change and coastal development, sea level rise and loss of nesting habitat, and then increased temperature effects on uh, and how they affect sea turtle biology. And then, of course, what really happens, what really causes endangerment of populations is when you have multiple effects, multiple factors uh, impacting a whole population. So let me just do a little sea turtle life history here for you. Sea turtles uh, lay their eggs on a beach and uh, the female turtle will usually lay multiple nests, but she won't nest every year. She'll only come back uh, every two or three or four or even five or seven years. Um, and those eggs, uh, she digs a hole, uh, the eggs uh, incubate for about two months and then the little sea turtles clamber out and dig their way out and run out to the ocean. You've probably seen this on a nature documentary or something. They are extremely cute and um, they do get eaten by a whole lot of stuff on their way out, um, but there are also a lot of them. Um, sea turtles lay uh, about 100 plus eggs per nest and can lay lots of nests in a year that they actually breed. So the little turtles go out to open ocean and a lot of them live in sargassum weed and other places in the centers of the gyres of the big oceans, the, the, the middle areas, um, and in generally uh, fairly warm water. And then at some point, they will make a decision to move into uh, coastal habitat. And the juveniles will then grow up in areas where they can feed on stuff on the bottom primarily. And this is for most of the hard shell turtles, so loggerheads, Kemp's Ridley's, hawksbills, and so on. And then um, after several years, in fact, in some cases, decades, a juvenile turtle will grow and reach maturity and come back uh, to nest, or if it's a male, will go to areas where females are congregating uh, for mating. So males also migrate, uh, but they, uh, from the feeding grounds to the breeding grounds, uh, but the males, ex with few exceptions, don't come out onto the beaches. Any of you who have been to Hawaii, you might have seen sea turtles uh, basking on the beaches there. That's actually a fairly rare phenomenon, um, but it's pretty cool uh, to see these turtles, males and females both, uh, lying out on the sand. So the main thing about turtles is that the chances of an individual actually reaching maturity and, and breeding for the first time is very low, especially for loggerhead and green turtles that take literally decades to reach maturity. So um, here's an example uh, for loggerhead turtles where each number below the little turtle symbol is the predicted probability of surviving from hatching from the time that it hatches out of the egg to that age. So just as an example, here's age seven. There's only a 12% chance that a turtle would make it to age seven. There's only a 0.6% chance that a turtle would make it to age 15. And loggerheads at the earliest mature at about 21, 22 years old and, on, and less than 0.1% uh, are actually going to make it uh, to that age. And that's where the estimate of one in a thousand hatchlings reaches maturity, if you've ever heard that estimate. 
So that's predicted. That's based on modeling and other things. We actually don't have a way to mark a hatchling turtle and follow it for 22 years to see if it reaches maturity. Um, but we're getting better. We have better uh, tags and things like that now. So maybe someday we'll actually be able to do that. Um, one of the things that that life history leads to is a situation where the things that affect the smallest turtles, the eggs and the hatchlings, don't necessarily have a big effect at the population level. And this was uh, how I got into this business in the first place. This is actually what got me excited about math. I, before, before this, I, you know, I took as little math as I could get away with as a biology major. Um, but this model that was published um, in, in the late 80s actually showed some a, a, an application of math that got me really excited about how math can be used to objectively evaluate conservation strategies. So here is from that 1987 model showing that if we do nothing, if the popular, if we just let the population go as it was currently trundling along, it would decline at about 5% per year. That's the red line here. And if we save every egg and every hatchling and raised it in captivity or something so that it made it to its first birthday, okay? So we saved it from all those terrible things that eat little baby sea turtles, the population would still decline. It'd go up for a little bit, for a short while, but ultimately it would continue to decline. And it's because there's just so many more years to go after that first year that changing the survival rate of the first year of life doesn't help you very much. And that was a big deal in terms of sea turtle conservation policy in the United States when this came out and the National Academy of Sciences uh, made recommendations about sea turtle conservation uh, with those modeling results. All right, now here's the other big cool thing about turtles that I'm going to tell you about today, which is that they have temperature dependent sex determination. So there's no X and, X and Y chromosomes. When temperatures are warmer, more females are produced. When temperatures are cooler, more males are produced. Males have long tails. That's why I put a long tail on this, on this turtle, okay? So what that means is that as we get into a climate situation where we have more warm temperature beaches, those nests, those eggs are gonna produce more uh, females. They're gonna become, more of them are gonna become females. Pretty cool, huh? And in the lab, if we take a nest of sea turtles and put it in an incubator and raise it at a single temperature, the difference between the temperature that produces all males and the temperature that produces all females is like two degrees, maybe three degrees centigrade. It's pretty remarkable. It turns out it's a little more complicated than that on a real beach because, you know, of course, the temperature is not constant on a regular beach, and because it also is affected by moisture. So how um, moist the sand is and if it stays moist throughout incubation, the, there's a whole bunch of different factors that actually determine what sex the hatchlings are for a given nest. But it is definitely the case that warm temperature beaches produce more females and cooler temperature beaches produce more males. The other thing is that hot beaches, when it gets really warm and really dry, the eggs cook. And we actually see a relationship between hatching success and incubation temperature for uh, all the sea turtle species, where uh, very high incubation temperatures lead to low hatchling survival or low hatching, hatchling success. So at some point, our beaches are going to be too warm. So I'm going to focus now on loggerhead turtles. This is a very nice looking loggerhead, a juvenile. Um, loggerheads uh, tend to be not the prettiest turtles um, and they bite a lot, um, but I really like them because they have an attitude. So loggerhead turtles uh, in, uh, occur in, uh, up the eastern seaboard here. Uh, 
with the largest nesting populations in East Florida. Um, but the, it's not just this part of Florida, it's actually the whole uh, coastline here. Then there's some on the other side of the Florida peninsula. There's a few up in the panhandle. And then there's little scattered bits of nesting around the Gulf of Mexico. Quintana Roo has a, a, a nesting beach, a few nesting beaches. Cuba. Um, and then up here, we have Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. These are actually, uh, by genetics, these, uh, this is a separate subpopulation. So those animals actually um, have different genetics. And since female turtles come back to a beach that's very, that is or is very close to the beach that, where they were born. That's part of why that differentiation happens. So these turtles up here are actually different genetically from the East and Southwest Florida turtles, which are a little bit different from Florida Panhandle and the other Gulf of Mexico turtles. Definitely different from these guys down in Cuba, dry tortugas and so on. And here's what's happening in South Florida. This is where my colleague, Jeanette Weineken is working. She's at Florida Atlantic University. And we see the percent female, uh, and these are different years. And you see that we have um, many years where we are approaching or even at 100% females on the beaches where she works, which is essentially um, from Boca Raton uh, southward. And those um, nesting beaches have a lot of turtles on them. And so they're producing a lot of females. And this has gotten us to wonder, well, at what point does this become a problem? Well, the question is, um, will there be enough males? <laughs> Okay, well, probably there will be for quite a while because most species take a long time to reach maturity, loggerheads about 20, uh, 22, 25, or even 30 years, and they have long lifespans. So uh, the females that we have now will live for a long time. Also, females do not breed every year, but males often do. So that allows for a sex ratio skew in the adults because the males are there every year, the females are not. At first, we would expect an increase in nests because more females are being produced per nest. And what we are counting when we count nests are of course the result of those females. But if females can't find a mate, they might skip reproduction altogether. And ultimately they may choose to nest less often because they can't find a male. Well, these are all what if, what if, what if, and that's my line of business, which, uh, so let's make a model, okay? So we're going to create a simulated turtle population, and I'll show you some results. Um, a simulated turtle population has nests and hatchlings and then some juveniles, and then some of those juveniles mature and start nesting, and then you have the turtles that are mature but are not nesting. Um, and then a few other things go in there, the, the number of eggs that they produce each year, that's these dashed arrows. And then these uh, arrows are the probability of surviving and, and growing, making it to that next stage. And all of that is put into a computer simulation. And we get um, outputs like uh, what I'm gonna show you here. So this is, uh, is a model I'm working on right now. Um, that is asking questions about, well, how many males are enough? Um, and so here you can see this is the, the um, sex ratio in the simulation. And this, the simulation is running for 300 years. And we see that um, in this particular set of simulations, I have a trend in the, in the proportion of females. So we're moving towards 100% female um, uh, nests. And, uh, but there's variability in it. So I've added some variance and sometimes uh, the sex ratio in a given year is pretty low. And other years it's at 100%. Um, we can look at the number of hatchlings through time and we can look at the breeders through time. And then we can ask questions about, okay, well, if males breed at the same rate as females, what happens to the population over time? And if males breed twice as often 
as females than what happens to the population over time. And we can look at the, the scale here and the, and the relative numbers. We can look at how long it takes the population to crash as we approach 100% females and so on. So we can ask a lot of questions, sort of the what if scenarios with a model like this. And that's some ongoing work that we're doing now. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainty, but models like this can at least help us kind of bracket and figure out, well, what's the realm of possibility? So the research priority that we have is the, the big question that we're asking is, will they adapt? Sea turtles seem to be climate change deniers, okay? They're not adapting really fast at the moment. Uh, turtles have strong fidelity to specific migratory patterns, breeding areas, and beaches, especially older animals. So once they get beyond their first couple of nestings, they come back to the same place. They come back to the same place even if a seawall's been built there and they just wander up and down uh, and, look, and then will eventually lay in their nest below the seawall and then their nest will get destroyed uh, at the next high tide. Large numbers of nests are on beaches that are simply too hot now in South Florida. And so we're seeing that egg mortality and then of course the sex ratio skew. Beach armoring, and that's the building of the seawalls, is increasing to reduce property loss for sea level rise. Uh, that's sort of a natural um, thing that's going on because uh, people don't wanna lose their homes and businesses and so on. Storm severity is increasing, leading to higher losses of nests in uh, some years and in some areas. But nest counts are increasing in the Northern states and younger females are less likely to have strong fidelity to a particular beach. So over time, we may see more females uh, uh, showing up on those uh, no more northern beaches, and we may actually see changes in behavior if the turtles are able to detect uh, these uh, bad conditions that are occurring on their beaches. So the question becomes, should we intervene? Should we let things go? Should we hope for natural adaptation? Or should we actually get involved? It's been, it's been hot before, okay, um, and they could adapt. Sea turtles have been around for about 100 million years, uh, the four families of, of turtles, and the modern hard shell turtles that we have now are thought to be about 30 to 40 million years old. So if we look at this graph here, we see there was a, the, these uh, sea turtles originally involved, evolved um, during the period when there were no polar ice caps, uh, it was all ocean out there. Uh, so, um, and, and now we're way down here, but we're seeing a big, you know, a big jump, but relative to when sea turtles evolved um, and diverged into the current species, um, it's actually quite a bit cooler. The other thing is that we've uh, had other spikes of temperature change uh, in, um, you know, more recent history. Uh, and somehow the sea turtles made it through those times, but there's a lot of other things that have changed and humans have done a lot of uh, changes to habitat and uh, provided other stressors like plastic bags, um, among other things to uh, be uh, damaging to sea turtle populations. Uh, and sea turtle individuals. And we love our sea turtles and we don't want them to suffer harm. So letting things go may not be societally acceptable. Having a whole nesting beach end up with a bunch of dead fried sea turtle eggs uh, when people want to see their, their uh, local hatchlings and so on uh, going out to sea is not something that people uh, are likely to accept. Um, and this is just an example from South Padre Island. All these people have shown up on this beach at dawn to watch the hatchling turtles uh, go out to sea. So people love these animals and it's hard to be sort of callous, I guess, and say, well, we'll just let them adapt and hope for the best. So that gets us to some mitigation strategies, passive to active. Um, Passive mitigation are activities that promote natural selection and adaptation 
to drive long-term change at the population level. So what can we do that kind of promotes that local adaptation? And then there's, there's kind of a continuum here and we can think about more active mitigation, immediate direct actions that enable short-term changes in survival or reproductive success and um, usually more often at the local level. So let's think of some ways to mitigate and make up for increasing beach temperatures for sea turtles. So think about that for a minute and think about what are some options, some things we could do that might help the sea turtles in Broward County, for example, or Miami-Dade County or something, um, where uh, you know, we have these super high temperatures and, and problems going on. Um, just be thinking about that for a minute. And I bet you're coming up with some pretty creative ideas and thoughts about it. Here's a few that uh, scientists have been talking about, and I've put them on a, uh, on a continuum here from passive to active. So at the very end of the continuum is doing nothing. Um, then we could protect some habitats to, uh, in, in areas that are further north and then wait for that natural rain shift to happen. We can do habitat modifications. We can plant trees. We could do something more artificial like uh, put shade structures up or water. Uh, remember I, I mentioned that the uh, moisture content also affects the sex ratio. So we could do that. We could deter turtles from nesting on beaches that are just too hot. Uh, Turtles don't like lights and bright noises. If we have big parties in Miami-Dade County, maybe the turtles won't come there to nest, they'll move further north. <laughs> we can have uh, hatcheries with temperature modulation or translocation where we actually raise turtles in one location and then release them further north. We can have other kinds of what they call now assisted colonization. This is actually starting to be a pretty big thing in fish and wildlife. Um, uh, sciences, uh, and, um, and even artificial selection uh, to try to promote adaptation to climate change. Other forms of captive rearing, and gotta say it, we can have GMO turtles. We could identify genes that are present in turtles that live in uh, warmer climates and seem to do fine there, and um, genetically manip manipulate sea turtles, who knows? So there's a lot of different things we could choose from there. So the main thing though, is that our choice for mitigation needs to be informed by science. Small scale experiments can evaluate whether we achieve the desired improvement in behavior or nest survival. Population models can predict how well the mitigation action, the conservation action will work at the population level. So we can scale up, we can use the models to scale up to whole populations. And we need to acknowledge that environmental change may be happening too rapidly or with too many other factors uh, for that genetic adaptation um, and natural selection to really do its job. But we need to be careful about interfering too much. And I'll show you an example of where that hasn't worked too well uh, in just a minute. Okay, we're ready for poll number two, Cinnamon. So to protect sea turtle hatchlings at the Southern Florida beaches, what would you do? You could do, I just gave you a few choices here and you can only pick one this time. You can do nothing. You can shade or water some nests. You can move nests to a cooler location and release, release the hatchlings where they came from. You could move nests to a cooler location and release the, release the hatchlings in a different place or you could introduce eggs or hatchlings from warmer areas. All right, see what you think. People are voting. Voting, voting, voting. All right, looks like we have about 30. I think we have, I'm just checking how many people we have online, about 48 here. So I'll give you another, Five, 10 seconds, 10 seconds. So this is specifically for those Southern Florida beaches. What would you do? All right, I'm gonna end the poll. 
and share the results. So interesting, we have kind of a bimodal distribution here. So we have quite, uh, quite a few folks want to uh, shade or water some nests and quite a few folks want to move the nest to a cooler location and release the hatchlings at a cooler location, maybe further north. So a more active uh, mitigation uh, conservation effort. And then a few folks uh, chose other things. So this, the, here's the thing. The science can inform what of these things might actually work, but they, it doesn't tell you what to do, okay? And so there's this, we have to remember that the science can only do so much. And what decision is actually made and what work is actually done um, is going to depend a lot on what, how, what the people who live in that area, um, as well as you know, how we want to manage endangered species in the United States, um, you know, it's more of a societal decision than uh, something that science can decide for us. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and move on here. We'll have one more poll before we're done here. So modeling, we can always model, right? And that's, that's the best part about this. Um, so here's an example. We can look at some of these uh, mitigation efforts and see, well, which ones are more likely to work, especially when we scale them up to a population level. So if we had a good male year, 40% males every three years on average, we see with that same, remember we have the increasing uh, temperatures over time, increasing proportion of females, but now we have randomly about every three years, we have a good male year. And you see what it does is it pushes that collapse of the population out pretty far um, uh, before we actually get to a point where it's just all females all the time. And, and so we can buy time at least um, with a mitigation action like that. But maybe more importantly, we can compare that strategy to another one like this. If we can do things that where, the, where we actually reduce the temperature trend so that it's not increasing quite as fast, we still see the temperature, the sex ratio is increasing over time, proportion female, but we see how far we can push out that population decline when, uh, if we can just slow down the temperature increases. So slowing down the temperature increases is, um, you know, something that could result maybe from some of those mitigation efforts on the beaches. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up here. So measuring effectiveness of a mitigation action, there's some questions we need to ask. What was the net effect on the hatchling production and the sex ratio? And at what scale? Are we talking about the scale of the experiment or the, the uh, manipulation that we're doing, or we're talking about the whole population scale? How variable was the effect? Did it work all the time or only in some years? And what is the feasibility of scaling up to have an impact at the regional level or the population level? So for example, how much shading is needed to increase male hatchling production by 1% or 5% or 10%? Again, we can ask those questions with some population models. And we need to think about um, how, what the, what the kind of, what it looks like relative to temperature. So what percent of nests need to be shaded to get a 10% increase in male hatchlings? Okay, so this is kind of another way to ask the same question. If the mean temperature is fairly low, then the percent of nests that would need to be protected is pretty, uh, is, is lower. And then as the temperature goes up, we expect that um, that percent of nests that need to be shaded or cooled off uh, would increase. It actually makes a difference if the shape of that relationship is like this, kind of an asymptote, or if it's more like this, because what that affects is the effectiveness um, of our strategy. In this case, um, we can get, the, the, there has to be a really big increase in the number, in the percent and number and percent of nests that are uh, shaded to, uh, as the temperature rises. Whereas in this case, it's a more gradual increase. 
So again, uh, we can do some of these uh, uh, simulations to ask these questions. Was the immediate problem reduced? Uh, were the temperatures lowered? Was moisture increased? Did it have the local effect that we actually hoped for? So this is more at the at the experimental level. Um, we like to use something called a backy design before, after control and impact. So we can look at improve it, at, at some result like improved survival or fewer deformities of the hatchlings, better sex ratios. Uh, and so on, but we need some controls. We need something to compare to. So we can look at what those um, numbers are before we do the experiment, after we do the experiment and compare those to, uh, 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 compare those to a control, some nests that we're not manipulating, okay? And then the impact nests are the ones that we're actually doing the experiment on. And then, always important to note if there's any unexpected positive or negative impacts of the mitigation action. Did it affect the nesting females? Did it attract predators? Was there some response of beachgoers to your new shade cloths? <laughs> there's any number of things that might happen that we're not expecting. And so we need to make sure that we're keeping track of those as well. A few things to think about as we move forward with sea turtle conservation or conservation of other species. Will mitigation improve hatchling survival and sex ratio and at what scale and how will we know? Will those actions affect population status and to what degree? And is that important? Is that our goal? Or is our goal more at a local level? And will these actions raise public awareness of climate change impacts? That may also be a really important question. I want to, I told you I'd bring up an example, something to think about, especially as we contemplate moving populations of animals around in response to climate change. We learned a lot from salmon, okay? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read this to you because I, 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 I think just the paragraph, it's a, it's a bit of a story that's important to think about. This is talking about salmon effort, uh, conservation efforts in the mid-1900s. The resulting fry, baby salmon, were shipped to streams all over the Northwest, not their home streams. Some were released directly into the Columbia at the hatchery. Sometimes eggs from as far away as Alaska were incubated at the central hatchery and then released into the Columbia. In this way, the scientists of the time believed fisheries science would rebuild the depleted Columbia salmon runs with fish from other rivers. But in hindsight, stock transfers created the biological equivalent of hash, a melting pot of fish genes that diluted native stocks. Transferring salmon from other river basins in the Columbia disrupted the process of natural selection and an adaptation that made Columbia River salmon uniquely suited to their home streams. And as a consequence, the fry were incubated at the hatchery and then released into the streams generally did not survive well. We actually have many examples of this kind of effort that have failed. Now we do hatchery work with salmon much, much better. We learned a lot, but I, I think it'd be unfortunate if we didn't look at some of these other species before we dive into active moving of sea turtle populations around the world in an effort to mitigate for climate change. Here's our final ta uh, uh, poll then. Put that up for us, Cinnamon, to protect sea turtles nesting in the United States over the next 50 years. What level of conservation action do you think we should take? What do you think we should do? Current protections only, increase habitat protection in cooler areas, but wait for the turtles to get there on their own, plant shade trees and water beaches, move some nests to cooler areas, protect and release male hatchlings, introduce animals or genes from populations that are adapted to warmer temperatures. Go ahead and vote. You only get one choice this time too. <laughs> All right, I'll give you about 10 more seconds here.
All righty. Well, we're all over the map, <laughs> which is great, right? And of course, we would immediately jump to our population models to see which of these would be most effective. But um, th there'll be a lot of uncertainty about that too. Uh, yes, there are a lot of options, a lot of things to think about, and a lot of experimental work that needs to be done um, before we engage in anything um, wholesale, you know, large scale. Uh, but it is very interesting to see how this plays out and not just for sea turtles, lots of other species are facing these same kinds of questions. So we want to run small scale experiments, whether we achieved and to evaluate whether we achieved the desired improvement on behavior or nesting survival. We want to develop population models that can predict how well the mitigation action will work at the population level and acknowledge that environmental change may be happening too rapidly. Thanks so much, everybody. It was great to have a chance to chat with you about this and hopefully we'll have a little time for questions. Thank you so very much. Yeah, I was just going to encourage everybody to put their questions in the chat so we can work through them. And while you're working on putting in your questions, we have a comment from Greg um, that says, I don't know if you can see the chat, uh, Selena, but I'll read it out loud for folks that can't. Um, it seems like climate change um, that is warming is a much bigger problem than just for sea turtles. So big picture solutions might be the best um, if they can be achieved. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I mean, we have a tendency to think about one species at a time, and sometimes that gets us in trouble. Uh, you know, we, sometimes the actions that we do that benefit one species are actually detrimental to another. Um, in general, yes, anything we can do to uh, look at and mitigate for global warming um, uh, at larger scales is the right action to take at this point. Um, but there may be, there's even if we stopped using fossil fuels tomorrow, there would be, there's a time lag and there's going to be increasing temperatures, increasing sea level rise and other things for a while. Um, and so some of the actions that we're talking about are being discussed with the sort of realistic expectation that we're not going to stop using fossil fuels tomorrow. And um, even if we continue on a good path to um, uh, mitigate for global warming at a large scale, uh, there may be some need for some sort of interventions in the meantime. Great. And I have a question why folks are still thinking about theirs. It might take us a little bit on a tangent, so feel free to bring me back. Um, but what is the advantage of the temperature selected uh, reproduction ratio? Like, why, why is that even a thing? Yeah, evolutionary biologists have, have had these uh, debates back and forth for a long time. Um, and actually, most reptiles have this, uh, and, and it varies. So in crocodiles, I believe, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, it's the opposite, where the higher temperatures make males and the lower temperature make females. Um, so there's probably some uh, biological history there uh, that they just didn't develop the sex chromosomes. Um, one theory that I've seen is that uh, the males, so, so of course there are some males that are produced at the higher temperature and some females that are produced at the lower temperature, but they tend to have lower fitness. They tend to be, um, you know, uh, have low performance uh, deformities and other kinds of things, which would tend to kind of stabilize that selection at least because um is there they, so so males uh so so we kind of you know just perpetuate uh that system um there's probably uh habitat related reasons for it um in some turtles uh, females uh, uh there can be differences in the sizes of eggs for males and females and so um where females are uh, produced by uh, somewhat larger eggs. And so larger females want to produce more large, <laughs> larger females can produce slightly larger eggs. So they go to warmer areas to lay their eggs. It's 
crazy. That is really interesting. I think Diamond we were Diamondback Terrapins, I saw that paper. <laughs> so, so I'm hoping that Bruce Burry or some other, you know, really sharp herpetologist, which I am not, uh, might have a, a more answers to that question and can type them in um, on chat if he's here at this talk. Nice. Well, there's a whole bunch of questions coming in. So since, okay. uh, I'll, I'll get us back on track here. So I'm going to go back up to Martha's. She said, is there any regulations um, in various states or countries that decrease building on beaches that interfere with nesting? Yeah, that's that's another area where the social science piece comes into play that's really interesting. And one of the um, concerns that I've had, we didn't have time to talk about it tonight, um, in Virginia and uh, some states, as you go further north, they don't have these laws to prevent armoring of beaches and seawall production. Whereas in North Carolina, for example, you can't build seawalls. So the concern that some of us have about waiting and seeing if the turtles just move on their own is that they may not have any place to go if the the more northern states allow that beach armoring and then those beaches end up washing away. Um, another part of the puzzle to kind of work through, but it's really interesting when you get into the the these uh, nuances to think about well what what are the local laws and regulations and and to try to think it's hard because you have to try to think decades into the future, not just what's happening right now. Yeah, that definitely changes the land use planning, not just protecting what's happening now, but having to think way out in the future. Um, we've got a question about, is it possible to tell male and female hatchlings apart in the field? Does that long tail of male show up um, at what stage? Yeah, unfortunately, no. And um, I uh, originally wanted to go to graduate school to do big uh, scale experiments on sex ratio and changes in uh, sea turtle uh, uh, populations over time with climate change and learned that you can't actually tell the sex of a hatchling sea turtle without killing it. Um, so I wasn't able to do that work. As it turns out, what you can do is um, raise them in captivity to a larger size and actually do a laparoscopy where you take a tiny little camera into the body of the turtle and you can look at the gonads and and after they get to be you know about um a month or two old you can actually tell at that point um you can't do a blood sample or something like that but the new thing that we're very excited about and this is out of Jeanette's lab is uh, the certain genes, of course, are expressed um, even right away uh, as some of those cells start to differentiate into ovaries and testes. So um, that's what they're looking into now is identifying which uh, what gets turned on basically um, uh, and when it gets turned on in hopes that we can uh, do it genetically. Nice. Um, this is a very detailed question, but uh, what particular software package or library for modeling, um, or do you write a customized code for modeling populations over time? Yeah, it depends on who I'm making a model for. So this model that I showed you tonight is actually in Excel. And the reason why I model in Excel is because I work with people who are not modelers and I provide tools for them to do these kinds of simulations and um, you know, kind of uh, experiments in a sense with the models themselves. Um, and uh, so most everybody has Excel. You can write code to make Excel do all kinds of things and including incorporating R code. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm using right now for this particular model. In the past, I've also used MathCAD and MATLAB, uh, but those are software packages that cost a lot of money. And so, especially when I'm working in um, uh, developing nations, uh, it's really important to use something that uh, everybody has access to. And I'll just put a little plug in that you have your um, email address on the screen now. So if folks have more detailed questions about anything particular, they might reach out to you specifically. Absolutely. Um, we have one more question coming in. Uh, it says, is there any evidence of unfertilized eggs developing into hatchlings? Uh, gosh, wasn't there something on this just a, a, a little bit? What, what animal was it that was producing, what, that what was parthenogenesizing recently? Condor. Con <laughs> yeah. Crazy, huh? Oh, look at that. Everybody Just says condor. shocking, right? Um, I don't know of any examples of that. Um, sea turtles mate and then store sperm. 
and then uh, fertilize their batches of eggs. The female is able to control the fertilization of the batches of eggs. And um, I don't think we know enough uh, about them to know if they could do that. But yeah, you know, you remember in J Jurassic Park where they talked about how, you know, adaptation happens, evolution happens, right? And, and eventually, you know, nature finds a way, I think is the way they phrased it in Jurassic Park. It is certainly possible that, you know, something like that could, could occur, um, but I don't know of any examples. When they store the sperm and use it, this is my question, um, is it from the same male? Not necessarily. They can mate multiple times and we have multiple paternity in nests. That's another thing that we look at to identify changes in sex ratio. Um, because normally a nest would have multiple fathers, um, but we can see a decline in the numbers of fathers over time in some populations. Interesting. Well, we have hit our seven o'clock time um, together. And so I just, again, want to thank you so much for spending the time with us and sharing um, one, this amazing photo that we have up right now, which is, yeah, heart is just <laughs> very warming and uh, yeah, it's great. So again, I just want to thank you for your time, your expertise and for everybody online. Thank you so much for spending time with us and taking time out of your evening um, to learn a little bit more about science and to learn a little bit more about the work that's happening here uh, at Oregon State University and uh, at Hatfield. So thank you, everybody. Um, please join Join us next month uh, when we have the Science on Tap on uh, the 19th. Um, and until then, you can see, Selena, you're getting lots and lots of thank yous and hand claps and all the yeah. things that happen in Zoom um, to tell us yeah, how much we appreciate right. you. I'm, my mom's on there somewhere, I'm pretty sure. So. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and end the presentation now. This is the hard part where we just abruptly end and we don't get to come up and say thank you so much to Selena. But, um, and until next time, everybody, thank you.